So in this lecture, you're going to begin the theory of differentiable functions of what you could call calculus or differentiable calculus uh, for functions that do not necessarily take values over the real line and do not necessarily have a domain contained in the real line. Actually, at some point, both the domain and counter domain will be general bottom spaces. But at this point, we're going to consider something simpler. We are going to be restricting ourselves to functions whose domains are either the whole real line R or subsets thereof. And the counter domains are going to be vector spaces. They're always going to be called W, always going to have a norm, norm of W. And we're going to be discussing two things. First of all, what does it mean for such a function to be differentiable? And we're going to be proving something related to the mean value theorem that we have for one variable calculus which is called the mean value inequality. You're going to make sense of it and try to understand why it's a nice result to have. Okay, so what's the definition? So here we have, sorry, here we have a function f from an interval of the real line to a vector space w that has a norm. And we're going to say that f is differentiable with t, right, this t here. If there exists this limit, of f uh, called f phi t is just a limit as you take the difference of f of t plus h and f of t divide by h and send h to zero. And if you want that in another form, we just say, well, the derivative exists if there exists this vector in w, which we call the derivative of f of t, such that whenever you take a sequence of non-zero real numbers, such that t plus h sub n is always an ab, right, so they can compute this value, and also such that h sub n goes to zero, then the difference between the quotient above, right, f of t plus h sub n minus f of t divided by h sub n, uh, the difference between that and this candidate for the derivative goes to zero in the topology of w. It goes to zero uh, when you take the norm of the difference, it goes to zero as n goes to infinity. So that's the definition of differentiable. It's exactly the usual definition that we have below the real line. So if W is a real line, right? And we have this interval here, AB. So I'm drawing here the graph of F. Here I have a point T. And the derivative, as we all know from calculus, gives me the slope of the line that I just drew, right? So I have this angle of theta. Uh, derivative of F of T is just the tangent of theta. Now imagine that w is equal to r to the k for some k and any norm. If we know all norms over our k are equivalent, meaning that a sequence that converges in one converges in the other. Therefore, if a function is differentiable with respect to one norm, it's differentiable with respect to any other. Now, let me go back to the previous board. The definition of f prime involves a limit. And we know, okay, now the, we're thinking that this guy is an element of our k and this too. Right, so the limit in particular becomes RK. And we know the limits in RK, if they exist, they're defined coordinate by coordinate. And that means that if I, def if I have a derivative for F of T, so it's simply I have to differentiate the coordinate functions. And how do we draw that? Well, let me think now of this curve. This curve consists of all values of F of T. So it's a curve that sort of swirls around space. So for each point in the interval a, b, right? So take this t tilde over here. Here I have f of t tilde. Take t, here I have f of t. And intuitively what this definition gives me is the tangent line, so the tangent vector here. Sorry, this shouldn't include this part here, so cross this out. This is the tangent vector to the curve at this point. It's the speed vector of the curve. And this definition actually makes sense for any w, though it's hardest to visualize if w says the space of continuous functions or some other bottom space. It's still true that you have a curve there, by right, that f corresponds to a curve, a parameterized curve if you want, and that f prime corresponds to this tangent vector. Okay, that's the definition, two basic examples. Now let's go back to the real line for a second, and we have this very important mean value theorem. What does it say? It says the following. So suppose you have a function uh, over the interval a, b closed. It doesn't need to be differentiable over the whole interval, and it needs to be differentiable in the interior of a, b, this open interval here. But it has to be continuous all the way up to the boundary. 
that in this case, for any two points in AB, there exists a point in the interval between them. Right here, I'm abusing notation a little bit because I don't know which one of x or y is smallest. But there exists a theta in the interval between them, such that the difference of f at y and at x is y minus x times the derivative at delta, at theta, sorry. Right, so this theta here is the guy who shows up here. So this is a very important theorem. It has many consequences, and let me mention one of them. So if the derivative is uniformly bounded in the interior of AB, and bounded by a constant L, then it turns out that F is L Lipschitz. And why, right? So, well, it's simply because you look at F of Y minus F of X, it's less than L times Y minus X. And why is that? Well, because this guy, this derivative over here, is always upper bounded by L, right? Because L is the supremum. So I know that a function that's differentiable at all points of an interval and has a bounded derivative in this interval has to be Lipschitz. And actually, if the function is differentiable, it's Lipschitz if and only if the derivative is uniformly bounded, sorry. So, yeah, so that's a very important theorem to have and particularly gives us a, a condition for a function to be Lipschitz. However, there is no extension of this theorem, and this is very important to understand, there's no extension of this theorem if W is a more general vector space. Remember, we're considering functions from the real line to a vector space. If you take the next simplest vector space after the real line, that would probably be R2, two-dimensional space. And here you have an explicit curve, an explicit function, that does not satisfy the mean value theorem when I take Y equals one and X equals zero. Actually, for any two points, I guess. And I mean, this is a calculation you can do you can assume that there exists such a theta or something like that, and it's not going to work, right? So in principle, what I write over here still makes sense in a vector space. This is a scalar, this is a vector. However, it's not going to work. You're not going to get the mean value theorem. Okay, this might be a bit of a disappointment, but fortunately, we have the mean value inequality, which at least gives us this Lipschitz property, right? So assume again that f is defined over the closed interval from A to B in the real line. Uh, w now is a Banach space, or any vector space, actually, with a norm. And assume F is continuous over the whole interval and differentiable in the interior. Then, what is being said here is that F is L Lipschitz, where L is the supremum of the derivative. So even though the mean value theorem is not true, that important consequence that implies the Lipschitz property for certain functions is still true. And our next goal will be to prove that result. And here we already have the first stage of the proof. First thing to notice is that I don't really need to know the mean value inequality for all x and y in the closed interval from A to B. I just need to know it uh, excluding, say, the left point, left hand point. Well, I can always assume that y is less than x, is more than x, sorry, because either what, either the two are equal, then there's nothing to prove, or one of them is less than the other. I'm going to assume without loss that the smallest one is x. And I can also assume that x is strictly larger than a, and how is that useful? Well, it's useful because it's, um, I mean, first of all, it, it, if I know this for all x that are larger than a, I can always take a limit when x goes to a, and get it for the whole interval, right? I had. But this is also useful because I want to be sort of inside the interval AB because that's where I know that F is differential. Okay. But now, I'm, what I'm going to show is also an inequality that's a little bit weaker than the mean value inequality. I'm going to show then that if I take X and Y in the interval AB with A closed, and A open and B closed, and X less than Y, I'm going to show that the mean value inequality holds if I take, instead of L, any constant that's larger than L. Right? That's the for all M greater than L. Right. If I know this, then I, I can let M decrease to L, take a limit, and then I also know that F of Y minus F of X is in norm less than L times Y minus X. And I know that for X strictly larger than A, but I can also make X equal to A by taking another limit. So... My claim, which I hope is clear, but you can check for yourself, 
is that if I know how to prove this star inequality here, then uh, I'm done. And therefore, I'm going to move on and prove star. So here's a key fact that we're going to prove now, or that we're going to argue now. It's this. So for any point t belonging to the open interval from a to b, there exists a delta. Let me emphasize that this delta may depend on t. Uh, such that for all points uh, t prime contained in the interval in this ball around t, right? So the interval from t minus delta t, t plus delta t. Uh, if I look at f of t prime and f of t, the distance between these two guys is less than m times t minus t prime, an absolute value. How do I know this? So this is why I have this m. As we're going to see now that m is a constant larger than l, which is a soup of the derivative, right? So, uh, and here's why I have it, because I want to have this open interval around t, right? How do we know this? So first of all, notice that t belongs to the open interval AB. Therefore, I'm making this delta small enough. I can ensure that this whole guy here, this whole interval, is contained, sorry, is contained in the closed interval AB. And therefore, I can compute this value of f of t prime. So there's no big deal here. But here's what's important. We know that f of t prime minus f of t divided by t, minus t prime minus t. This thing here, when t converges to t prime, or t prime converges to t, sorry. Remember, that's like calling t prime is equal to t plus h. And then we have exactly the, qu the quotient that defines the derivative. Therefore, what's inside the norm converges to the derivative of f of t. And uh, I can also move the limit to inside the norm. I mean, that's just continuity. This derivative of t, this is less than or equal to L, which is the supremum of the derivative. And this is strictly less than M. And that's what we're going to use. Because now, notice, what do we know? We know that the limit, this limit here, is less than M. And what does that mean? That means that if I'm close enough to t, right, before I take the limit, so to speak, but once I'm close enough to t, this ratio here is less than or equal to m if t prime minus t is small. And that's exactly what we're saying above. What we're saying above is that if t prime is a distance less than delta of t uh, from from uh, t, then we know that the distance between f of t prime and f of t is at most m times the distance from t prime to t. Of course, I have to shuffle things around a little bit. Uh, this is uh, uh, actually not true if t prime is equal to t, because this, qu this quotient here is not defined. However, if t prime equals to t, then this inequality is clearly true. It's trivially true, right? So I've shown what I needed to argue to prove this key fact. And OK, you may ask again, why is this key fact useful? Let me try to explain with a picture. Here I have x. Here I have y. What I want to argue is that, let's say I have the value of f of x here. I'm pretending that my function takes values of the real line. And here I have a value like x plus something small. Let me call that epsilon. And epsilon is less than delta of x, so it's small enough. What we've just shown, our key fact, is that if, ep if epsilon is small enough, then the value of f at this point has to be inside a cone-shaped region, something like this. And the points here are like f of x plus m times epsilon, f of x minus m times epsilon. 
So what I mean is that I can move a little bit to the right and only change the value of f in norm, right, by something that's m times the distance that I moved. And I can keep doing that, right? So I can go from x to f, x plus epsilon plus x plus prime. And again, I know that the function cannot change by much. And I could keep doing that until I reach y, then I'd be done. I'd say, okay, from here to here, the change in f is at most m times the distance, from here to here as well, from here to here as well. And therefore, the total change was at, at least at the most, the sum of the individual changes will be at most m times the distance between y and x. That would be very fine and it happens to work, but uh, it could be that this amount that you can walk to the left, the, to the right, sorry, uh, it could be that this amount sh shrinks as you move to the right. Therefore, you can move from here to here, but you can move half as much and then less than that and then less than that, so that. And maybe you never get to y. So it could be that this guy shrinks as you move, right? This amount you're allowed to move, just from the key fact, it could be that it shrinks. Okay. Now, let's uh, try to deal with that by an indirect route. So what I'm going to do, remember, I want to prove this inequality star here. I'm taking an m that's larger than the soup of the derivative. And I want to prove that the distance between f of y and f of x at most m times y minus x when y is larger than x. So here, what I'm going to show, I'm going to define the set i of x. It actually depends on y too. But the set of all points in the interval from x to y such that f of t minus f of x is uh, less than t m times t minus x. So let me mention a few things about the set. First of all, trivially, t belongs to i of x. Because by, by sorry, x belongs to i, i of x. Because, well, if I set t equals to x and I get 0 less than or equal to 0 so that's easy here's something less trivial i of x is closed well I'm going to say closed and bounded therefore compact but we're not going to really use compact but it's bounded because it's contained in a bounded set this interval from x to y why is it closed well all you have to argue is that if I take a sequence t sub n here and I have this relation, right, the sequence of the set, so f, distance of f of t sub n to f of x less than m times distance from t sub n to x, that this relationship is preserved to the limit, but that's only continuity, so there's no big deal here. Right, so it's closed because it, if you take a sequence, t sub n inside the set that converges to t, then t also has to be in the set. Okay, my set is closed and bounded, non-empty, therefore, it makes sense to uh, to compute its supremum. That's a number in this interval too. How do I know that? Well, I mean, it certainly has to be greater than or equal to x because x belongs to the set. It has to be less or equal to y because i of x is contained in this interval. Therefore, y is an upper bound. But the important thing for us is going to be that x s belongs to i of x. And that's just because i of x is closed. When a set is closed, its supremum has to belong to it. Right? Just because the supremum is a limit of a sequence of elements in i of x. Here's the claim that I want to prove. And I, it's a claim that finishes the proof. I'm going to argue that s equals y. That's basically what corresponds to my previous picture, to say that I can move from x to y, that I can, I was gonna see, right? So they have, that's not entirely clear from what I'm saying, but saying that if I keep pushing, and keep moving as much as possible to the right using this technique, I am going to reach y. And notice that if I know that, uh, this gives me 
that star go from before and why because in that if y is the supremum and the supremum belongs to i of x then f of y here let me read the subscript here then i have f of y minus f of x less than m times y of x which is star okay so once i prove that the supremum is y then i'm done how am i going to prove that well let's do it by contradiction so if s is not y then i know that s well s is certainly greater than or equal to x let's say that it's less than y so in particular Uh, I know that even if y equals, remember that y is less or equal to b, a is less or is less a, so s belongs to the interval a, b. By our key fact, I can walk a little bit to the left of epsilon, so that s plus epsilon still belongs to the interval x, y, right? So s is strictly smaller than y, so I can walk a little bit to the left, making sure that it stays inside the interval, closed interval S -Y, X, Y. And I know that F of S plus Epsilon, distance between F, values of F, has to be less than or equal to M times Epsilon. Right, is that a key fact? It surely is. Let's go back and check. This is saying that I can move both to the left and to the right with this property here right, this inequality, right, so given t, in the, the open interval a and b, you can move both to the left or to the right, preserving this property. So here I chose to move to the left, this is my t, this is my t prime, right, and t prime has to be inside that interval, but that's why I take epsilon small enough, and this is t prime minus t, which in this case is a positive number, so I don't need to take the absolute value. So now I know this, and look, if I want to compute f of s plus epsilon minus f of t, I can use subadditivity of the norm and say this is f at most f s plus epsilon minus f of s plus f of s minus f of t. And how do I bound this? Well, this guy over here is less than m epsilon this guy is less than m times s minus t because s belongs to the set i of x so let me write this over here so f of s minus f of t is less than m times sorry there's not t right this should be x sorry about that f of x so here I have this, s minus x, because s is the soup of i of x, and the soup belongs to i of x, as we saw before. I also have f of s plus epsilon minus f of s, w, less than m times epsilon. And if I combine the two, I have that f of s plus epsilon minus f of x, I can upper bound it by the sum of distance of f of s plus epsilon minus f of s with f of s minus f of x minus, and it's like, sorry, less than the sum of these two terms. So m s plus epsilon minus x. But I claim that this tells us that s plus epsilon belongs to i of x and why is that well we have to check right so how does a number get to belong to i of x it has to be between x and y and s plus epsilon satisfies that moreover this number has to satisfy this inequality here that we postulated right that was the definition so f of t minus f of x has to be less than m of t minus x but that's precisely what we have over here that f of f minus s plus epsilon minus x minus f of x is less than m times the difference between s plus epsilon and x. Therefore, s plus epsilon belongs to i of x, 
but this is a contradiction because uh, s is the soup of i of x and is strictly smaller than s plus epsilon. The soup has to be larger than or equal to any elements of i of x. Therefore, there's something wrong here. What is this thing wrong? So we claimed that s was equal to y, and then we assumed that the contrary was true, that f was less than y, and we arrived at a contradiction. Therefore, we have proven our claim. And the claim, as noted, implies the mean value inequality. It implies the mean value inequality not with this constant L, but with the constant M larger than L. It implies the mean value inequality not for the whole interval of values A and B, but only if we exclude A. But we can get rid of both things by taking limits, as we noted before. And this means we are done. We have proven the mean value inequality, which is a sort of substitute for the mean value theorem for, for one value variable calculus which, as we've seen, does not hold in this generality. Okay, thank you very much. In the next video, we're going to be seeing things about how you integrate vector valued functions. The domain is still going to be an interval of the real line. And we're going to prove a version of the fundamental theorem of calculus for these spaces.